Since 1980, contemporary art has evolved in response to an increasingly interconnected world shaped by diverse global forces. Advances in digital technology, transportation, and communication, along with historical processes such as colonization, have accelerated transnational connections, enabling greater migration and economic globalization, which in turn has expanded the reach and accessibility of art across borders. As a result, the global art market has expanded beyond Europe and the United States, with major art fairs and biennials now being held worldwide. These events foster a dynamic, multicultural art scene and provide platforms for artists to address timely issues. Common themes in global contemporary art include connections with place and diaspora, reactions to historical and current events, curiosity about language and communication, information and connection, explorations of hybrid identities and bodies, reflections on human impacts on ecosystems, and engagement with digital technologies and the internet. Now I'm going to show kind of a selection of global contemporary artists and their works. By no means is this um, going to cover every single um, artist or artwork that is out there. And by no means are we going to be able to cover every single theme that these artists introduce, but it's my hope to provide a sort of um, well-rounded and varied selection here. Um, and keep in mind, you know, I, I've listed a few common themes to kind of keep your eyes open for. Um, this, this is going to have some kind of overlap. More than one theme will be evident in a single work of art. Um, and then other themes that I've not listed will also be evident as well. So the sense of place holds profound importance for many artists, and it's deeply intertwined with identity and personal history. For many, this connection is fraught with painful memories, such as the forced separation from ancestral lands, struggles for sovereignty, and the persistent oppression of indigenous and marginalized populations, all of which have left lasting scars. Artists often engage with themes of place to reclaim space, preserve memories, and resist erasure. And by invoking place, they address histories of displacement and challenge viewers to reconsider the boundaries that divide us. Lynn Onus, an artist of mixed Indigenous Australian and Scottish heritage, exemplifies this connection with place. Born into a politically active family involved in the indigenous land rights movement, Onus taught himself to paint, developing a unique style that merges European realism with indigenous Australian imagery and design elements. In 1986, Onus visited Maningrida, a remote rural community in Arnhem Land, Australia, and there he worked closely with senior indigenous artists, learning about traditional imagery and a distinctive cross-hatching technique that is characteristic of Arnhem Land painting known as RARC. Um, so Onus integrated this style into his naturalistic depictions of animals and fish, blending realism with indigenous symbolism. One of Onus's most iconic works is titled Fruit Bats from 1991, and it features a suspended flock of fiberglass fruit bats with wings decorated in rark designs. The bats hang from a hill's hoist clothesline, a common fixture in Australian suburban yards, which here symbolizes the encroachment of settler Australians into indigenous lands. Beneath the bats are painted discs that represent bat droppings. This detail symbolically suggests that the bats, as representatives of the original indigenous inhabitants of this area, are sort of reclaiming the suburban space. For Onus, this work serves as a powerful reminder to settler Australians that they live on indigenous lands, and it underscores the lasting impact of colonial intrusion into indigenous spaces. 
Somewhat similarly, Rebecca Belmore is a Canadian artist of Anishinaabe heritage, and she creates art that speaks to Indigenous peoples' historical and ongoing separation from their ancestral lands. So her ancestors lived around the Great Lakes region, spanning what is now the United States and Canada, and Belmore's work often reflects a deep connection to these lands and the struggle to maintain a relationship with them. Since the 1990s, Belmore has been exploring themes of indigenous land rights and environmental respect in her artworks. One of her earlier notable works was a large megaphone-shaped sculpture made from wood, leather, and animal hides. She traveled across Canada with this piece, visiting locations where indigenous communities were asserting their claims to the land. Belmore invited indigenous people to speak directly into the sculpture, addressing their words to the earth itself. Equipped with a microphone, the megaphone amplified their voices, creating a space where the land could hear the voices of those who have long been its stewards. In 2017, Belmore adapted the megaphone form to create a new project titled Wave Sound. This installation, seen in the slide here, reflects her deep concern for the environment amidst the urgency of ecological threats such as resource exploitation, habit destruction, and biodiversity loss. For Wave Sound, Belmore created four large megaphone sculptures, each installed in a different Canadian national park. Collectively, these pieces invite visitors to engage with the natural world in a unique way. One of these sculptures is located in the Pukaskawa National Park, which is facing Lake Superior. This particular piece weighs about 170 pounds and it's made from aluminum and it has surfaces cast from the rock outcroppings of the surrounding landscape. By placing an ear to the sculpture, visitors can listen to the amplified sounds of the environment, crashing waves from the lake, native bird song, and other natural sounds that are distinctive to the area. Belmore's intention with Wave Sound was to encourage people to reconnect with the land on an emotional and visceral level. By listening to the natural sounds of specific places, she hoped visitors would rekindle an attachment to wilderness areas that are increasingly under threat. Through her work, Belmore emphasizes the importance of environmental stewardship and the role of indigenous perspectives in caring for the earth. The theme of place also holds profound significance for many contemporary diasporic artists. Diaspora refers to members of any population who have been displaced or dispersed from their homelands and live in foreign countries. The term encompasses both displaced peoples and their descendants. Diasporic artists often explore their unique identities by creating works that merge cultural memories and artistic practices from at least two different cultural traditions. Through their artworks, these artists may share the experiences of their communities, honor their distinctive heritage, or draw attention to the complex, entangled identities that they embody. The Singh twins, Amrit Singh and Rabindra Kaur Singh, are British-born identical twin sisters from a large Sikh family who bring a unique perspective to diasporic art. Their family immigrated from India's Punjab region in 1948, and the twins first visited India in 1980, when they became fascinated by South Asian miniature painting traditions from the 16th to the 19th centuries. This traditional art form, characterized by intricate details and flattened space, had a significant influence on their work. Their works demonstrate a unique synthesis of influences. The dense detail and flattened spatial planes of traditional South Asian miniatures are combined with European aesthetics and eclectic references to global pop culture. This stylistic blend mirrors the multiple identities of immigrants who celebrate their heritage while simultaneously engaging with the culture of their adopted countries. In this work, titled The Last Supper, the Singh twins depict a close-knit British Sikh family gathered in a dining room for Christmas dinner. 
The scene is filled with cultural and religious references. A model of the Taj Mahal sits near a Christmas tree and Leonardo da Vinci's painting The Last Supper hangs on the wall behind a crowded table. The room contains various religious icons, from Buddha to the Virgin Mary, promoting a message of religious tolerance and unity. Through their work, the Singh twins challenge stereotypes about acceptable styles and iconography within contemporary art. By adopting a medium and aesthetic that blends both European and Asian traditional and modern, they defy conventions and highlight the richness of diasporic identities. Ajian is another example of a diasporic artist. He was originally from Beijing and he settled in Sydney, Australia in 1990 following the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests in China. A self-taught artist, Ajian began experimenting with porcelain body casts in the late 1990s as a means of exploring his own cultural identity and sense of displacement. To create these works, he traveled to Jingdezhen, the traditional center of Chinese porcelain production and export since the Ming Dynasty, where he collaborated with skilled artisans to bring his vision to life. Ajian's China China series and his later Human Human series consist of decorated porcelain busts that are modeled from plaster casts of real people. For the China China series, he often used older Chinese men as his models. Each bust incorporates traditional Chinese porcelain techniques and decorative motifs, but the format, a sculpted portrait bust, draws from the traditions of Hellenistic Greece and ancient Rome. In combining these elements, Ajian delves into ideas of Chinese identity and the complexities of cultural heritage. One bust in particular, China China No. 71, is decorated with images of traditional Chinese architecture and the landscapes of an imperial garden. The combination of the three-dimensional form and the two-dimensional landscape, as if the latter imagery were tattooed on the physical body, generates a sort of disquieting effect that emphasizes the enduring presence of cultural heritage in shaping one's identity. By using ordinary people as models, Ajian democratizes the classical format of the portrait bust. Each piece is both individual and anonymous, um, representing sort of a specific person as well as a shared human experience. Throughout these series, Ajian conveys that cultural heritage is an inseparable part of one's identity, even in a diasporic context. Indian artist Rina Sani Kalat's work, Woven Chronicle, explores borders, migration, and the forces that separate communities and displace individuals. Her installation consists of a world map made from vibrant, knotted electrical wires, which outline the borders of nations. The wires are thickly woven, and each region, continent, and country is distinguished by its own color, making the layout of the globe both recognizable and visually striking. Draped across the map is a length of barbed wire, crossing borders and forming new ones um, that are very jagged and um, sort of dividing. The barbed wire serves as a powerful symbol of separation and containment. For Kalat, this image holds personal significance, as her own family was divided by the border that was drawn between India and Pakistan during the partition. She has remarked that the barbed wire in her work reflects the historical and ongoing movement of people across borders, displaced persons, refugees, and migrant laborers, all navigating spaces marked by conflict and restriction. Kala enhances the immersive experience of Woven Chronicle by also incorporating sound. Recordings and mechanical sounds, including pulsing beats, horns, sirens, and birdsong, play from speakers that are embedded within the map. These sounds mirror the paths of migration that crisscross the globe, providing a haunting soundtrack to the journey of displaced communities. Through this auditory component, Kalat reflects the sense of movement and flow, capturing the rhythms of global displacement and migration. 
Using the map as her canvas, Collat critiques our perceptions and the hierarchies implied by cartographic conventions. In some versions of this work, she inverts the map so that the southern hemisphere appears at the top, ultimately challenging the notion of a fixed top or bottom of the world. This inversion questions the traditional worldview that places certain regions in a dominant position over others, a hierarchy that exists only in perception. Collat points out that a globe, after all, has no true top or bottom, and subtly reminds us that our understanding of place is shaped by social constructs rather than geographical realities. Through works like Woven Chronicle, Kala invites viewers to reconsider the arbitrary nature of borders and the inequities that are embedded within them. Her work addresses the physical and emotional weight of boundaries, challenging us to confront the ways in which borders impact lives, divide communities, and shape identities. By reimagining the globe, she encourages us to see beyond the barriers that separate us, to envision a world not confined by artificial lines, but united by shared histories and collective movements. So we've already discussed contemporary Chinese artist and activist Ai Weiwei. His exploration of cultural heritage, history, politics, tradition, and his open critique of the Chinese government. In more recent years, Ai Weiwei has dedicated much of his art and activism documenting the challenging experiences faced by millions of displaced individuals worldwide and advocating for the rights of refugees. The number of refugees forcibly displaced from their homes in 2022 alone is estimated to be over 100 million, an increase of nearly 25% from the year before. The refugee crisis is a persistent issue communicated into the Western consciousness via media outlets with images of overflowing dinghies and large traveling masses often plastered onto front pages and TV screens, disseminating warnings of the dangerous consequences of illegal immigration. This mode of coverage, often consisting of generalizing figures and statistics, tends to desensitize public consciousness, however. Um, televisions can be switched off and newspapers can be folded and put away to avoid the chaotic scenes on the borders. Ai Weiwei's conceptual artworks, however, act as a tool to communicate the refugee experience, visually articulating issues spanning immigration, conflict, and the violation of human rights. Using different media, including sculpture, film, installation, and architecture, Weiwei harnesses his own experiences of political injustice and displacement to produce sobering confrontations with the viewer that are often somewhat uncomfortable to digest. Ai Weiwei was born into the heated political climate of Beijing in 1957, which saw Mao Zedong's cultural revolution and his attempts to eradicate China of its creative outlets, such as journalists, writers, and intellectuals. Among this outlawed group was Ai Weiwei's father, Ai Qing, a famous poet of the time. Consequently, the whole family was expelled from their home and forced to live in a labor slash re-education camp on the border of China, where they were subject to daily acts of discrimination and dehumanization. As a result of this displacement from such an early age, Ai Weiwei has been outspoken throughout his artistic career about his resonance with the global refugee condition and the detrimental impacts of manipulation of authoritarian power. This traumatic personal history has certainly given him impetus um, for his career and sort of caused him to um, be dedicated to the inextricability of art and activism, stating, quote, an artist must be an activist. In 2015, during the European refugee crisis, over 1 million migrants arrived via sea in the European Union by taking perilous journeys across the Mediterranean. 
Ai Weiwei traveled to Greek and German refugee camps, witnessing the departures and arrivals of refugees via boats, and this experience, combined with his own personal history, inspired him to create poignant installations that incorporate items directly associated with the refugee experience and that call for empathy, solidarity, and a deeper acknowledgement of our shared humanity. Ai's perspective on the refugee crisis is profound and straightforward. He says, quote, there is no refugee crisis, only a human crisis. In dealing with refugees, we've lost our very basic values. In this time of uncertainty, we need more tolerance, compassion, and trust for each other since we are all one. Otherwise, humanity will face an even bigger crisis, end quote. One of Ai Weiwei's significant installations addressing the refugee crisis took place in 2017 at the Konzerthaus in Berlin. This powerful work involved draping 14,000 life jackets across six columns of the building's facade. These life jackets were collected from refugees who had traveled via the dangerous sea route to the Greek island of Lesbos. I, who had visited Lesbos multiple times to witness the conditions faced by arriving refugees, received approval from local authorities to transport these life jackets to Berlin for this installation. Thousands of discarded life jackets still litter the beaches and landfills of Lesbos, testifying to the scale of the crisis. With this installation, Ai Weiwei sought not only to raise awareness of the refugee crisis, but to remind viewers of the countless lives changed by it. Each life jacket symbolized an individual, a man, woman, or child, whose journey to Lesbos marked the beginning of an uncertain struggle for survival and stability. A lifeboat hung at the center of the installation bearing the hashtag safe passage, underscoring the urgent need for safer pathways for refugees seeking safety. In another 2017 installation at an art museum in Copenhagen, Denmark, Ai Weiwei used 3,500 life jackets to fill the museum's windows, marking the United Nations World Refugee Day. The installation, titled Sol Levant, which is French for rising sun, played on the dual meanings of sunrise as something beautiful to look at and the idea of windows through which we view the world. Here, however, the windows are blocked by the life jackets, evoking feelings of entrapment and restriction. The title Sol Levant also references Claude Monet's Impression Sol Levant, which is a painting that depicted a harbor during the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, a period marked by industrialization, migration, and displacement. Ai's choice of title and materials links the current refugee crisis to historical patterns of war, migration, and upheaval, underscoring the recurring themes of displacement and survival. In 2018, Ai Weiwei presented Law of the Journey, a massive inflatable installation that appeared at the 21st Biennial of Sydney. This 230-foot black rubber boat immortalizes the image of a forced, unnavigated evacuation undertaken by many and is constructed of the same materials and manufactured by the same factory that produces many of the inflatable rubber boats that are used by refugees to cross the Mediterranean Sea to Europe. Crammed inside the confines of the boat are 300 inflatable human figures, seemingly overflowing the boat's parameters. They sit static and faceless, their anonymity citing the consumption of the refugee crisis via media coverage, which often presents them as an undistinguishable mass group of statistics. At the end of the hall, there are stairs, which led to an elevated viewing space, revealing the children huddled at the floor of the boat um, and isolated figures clinging to dinghies on the bare floor, while others um, seem to sort of float in the invisible water as if they're dead. The walls surrounding the boat were pasted with a custom wallpaper, a mosaic-like pattern of photographs taken by Ai Weiwei himself on his iPhone, um, images of refugees, shelters, and barbed wire, and then 
televisions played clips from his 2017 documentary Human Flow, which was a sort of investigative journey into the personal lives of displaced peoples. And it was filmed over the course of a year across 23 countries. Um, Human Flow as a documentary it really captures the staggering scale of the refugee crisis while also emphasizing its deeply personal impact on individuals and communities. The entire viewing experience of Law of the Journey, curated from different forms of media, hinders passive viewing. It implicates the viewer in this three-dimensional experience of the refugee crisis. It provides a visual representation for the public consciousness, unable to distance themselves by switching off the news or scrolling past a photograph. Furthermore, its installation into the former 1928 Trade Fair Palace, a congregation for the Jews before their exile to concentration camps, pervades this exhibit with a historical potency of suffering and displacement. Through this moral expression, Ai Weiwei pinpoints the individual experiences of the refugees, condemning the political and civic institutions who have been complicit with their suffering. Clearly, various aspects of cultural and personal identity are significant issues for many contemporary artists, but some, like Ai Weiwei, take things further, assuming intentionally political stances, calling attention to shifting social causes and current issues, prompting viewers to converse and learn about other cultures and experiences to inspire social protest and change. French photographer and street artist J.R. addresses political conflicts through his public art projects and has dedicated his career to giving a voice to the unseen and marginalized. Born in 1983 to an Eastern European father and a Tunisian mother, J.R. grew up in the immigrant suburbs of Paris, a background that greatly influences his work and the subjects he chooses to depict. In 2004, J.R. began his 28 Millimeters Project, an ongoing collection of photographic series in which the artist photographs marginalized groups of society using a 28 millimeter camera lens, creating exaggerated close-ups of their faces. For his first series in this project, Portrait of a Generation, J.R. photographed young, lower-class citizens in Parisian suburbs and pasted their large-scale portraits onto public walls in wealthier neighborhoods. The series took on a new sense of urgency after a number of riots erupted in 2005 following the deaths of two teenage boys in a Parisian suburb. The media and government portrayed the rioters in a negative light, often using stereotypes that painted them as quote-unquote thugs. J.R., who knew many of these young people personally, responded by photographing them, again, kind of creating these close-up portraits with intense expressions that were intended to confront viewers and kind of force them to see these individuals not as criminals, but as real people with names, ages, and identities. In one striking image, J.R.'s friend stands in front of a group his expression menacing, kind of holding his camera up like a gun as if he's about to shoot. In 2007, JR expanded the focus of his 28mm project beyond Paris to address the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in his series titled Face to Face. He questioned the media's portrayal of the conflict in the Middle East and wanted to explore the humanity on both sides to overcome the prejudicial ideas of the other. J.R. photographed Israeli and Palestinian individuals who shared similar roles in society, doctors, teachers, artists, and others, um, again, focusing closely on their faces and um, actions, kind of capturing playful expressions, as well as serious ones, and kind of emphasizing universal emotions and gestures. He then pasted large-scale versions of these portraits along the West Bank barrier wall that divides Israel from Palestine. 
For this project, JR faced a certain degree of criticism because he put these pictures of Israeli and Palestinian individuals in quote unquote enemy zones. However, many viewers on both sides were both intrigued and entertained by this project, which highlighted the similarities between the two cultural groups, so much so that many viewers found it basically impossible to distinguish who was Israeli and who was Palestinian. Palestinian just based on their portraits. Ultimately, the series helped communicate the absurdity of the discord between the two nations, promoting tolerance and peace, and encouraging them to see each other not as enemies, but as individuals. The development of JR's evolving artistic and socially engaged practice also took him in the direction of advocating for women's rights. In 2008, he began his third series within the 28 Millimeters Project, titled Women Are Heroes, which produced compelling, larger-than-life portraits that capture the resilience and struggles of women and bring attention to stories that often go unnoticed, and ultimately honor women as the often unrecognized pillars of their communities. He focused on women who suffered disproportionately during war and conflict, especially in places where they were victims of crime, rape, or religious oppression as well. He began the project in the Moro de Providencia Favela in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where he pasted large-scale portraits of local women onto buildings in the neighborhood to draw attention to the tragic story of their three young male relatives who had been killed by rival gangs. The initiative quickly expanded to include other women in nearby communities with portraits, some serious and some not so much, emphasizing the sort of emotional expression within the sitter's eyes um, and then pasted up so that they cover whole houses or buildings and are visible from blocks away. JR also went on to replicate the Women Are Heroes project in other places, including Kenya, Cambodia, and India. In the Kaibera slum of Nairobi, Kenya, for instance, he pasted images of women's eyes onto moving trains and onto rooftops of homes using water-resistant materials that would protect the homes from heavy rains. In Cambodia, the portraits highlighted women fighting to keep their homes amid a real estate boom, with their images displayed on buildings that were slated for demolition. In India, where posting such images was forbidden, JR cleverly used sheets of paper that were painted with transparent glue and then allowed the dust from the streets, or as seen in this photo, the um, powder from the Holi festival um, to sort of stick to that paper and reveal the portraits over time. In 2017, JR turned his attention to the U.S.-Mexico border. In the wake of the U.S. government's announcement to end the DACA program, JR created a powerful installation featuring a 65-foot mural of a one-year-old Mexican boy named Kikito, peering curiously over the border wall from the Mexican side. This image emphasizes the human element of immigration and calls attention to the direct impact that ending the DACA program would have on youths. It also calls into question the arbitrary nature of borders, the families that are divided, and the lives that are lost because of them. The mural stayed up for one month, and on its final day, JR organized Picnic Across the Border, inviting people from both sides to come together for a shared meal. On the U.S. side, tables were set up, while on the Mexican side, people gathered on blankets. The event was a poignant commentary on economic disparities, as well as the artificial barriers that separate families and communities. People on both sides enjoyed the same food and listened to the same music played by a band that was positioned across the border. The event even included a photograph of Myra, a DACA dreamer whose eyes were printed on the tablecloths, a powerful reminder of the young people whose lives hang in the balance due to these immigration policies. 
JR's projects ultimately reflect his commitment to making art that speaks to social issues from the streets of Paris to conflict zones around the globe. Through his portraits and installations, he fosters empathy, challenges stereotypes, and reminds us of the shared humanity that transcends borders, cultures, and conflicts.